All right, all right. What's up, everybody? This is TK. Welcome to another Revolution of One live stream. Just so you know, we are here every Tuesday, every Wednesday, and every Thursday at noon. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, I do my segment, TK's Two Cents, where I pick two tweets from the week, and I take you beyond 140 characters, kind of talk about how to apply that idea into your life, where I answer questions about the tweets and give you a little bit of context. And then on Wednesdays, which is today, we have the Revolution of One live stream where me and Kamau and uh, usually another guest, uh, we talk about what's going on right now. And I'm really excited about this week's episode because uh, we're going to be talking about mental health. And that is huge right now for a lot of the things that people are going through from the economic lockdown, fear of COVID-19, uh, tense discussions about racial tension, um, there's a lot of stress, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of anger, frustration, anxiety. How do we handle all of these feelings? How do we process our emotions authentically and, and deal with all of those challenges, especially in, in the context of relationships? And so the guest that we have today is my man, Richard L. Taylor. Uh, this brother is a mental health champion. He's the author of six books. Uh, you know, most people go to their grave dreaming of writing one, uh, Richard is just getting started. He's still in the middle of his first act, and the brother's already written six books. Uh, one of them is is called The Other Side, and, and it's him talking about how he overcame uh, depression and suicide. And we're going to talk about his story. We're going to talk about some of his insights and tips on on how to cultivate mental health. But Richard, man, I'm just glad you joined us. Welcome to the welcome to the live stream, brother. Hey man, thank y'all for having me. I'm excited to be here. I like that. The first act, right? So now that's that's <laughs> wait on me to make sure that I get more work done. <laughs> I love it, man. No, thank you guys for having me though, seriously. Yeah, man. I want you to look at that picture right there. I chose that picture because I love don't know it. if you ever saw the one with uh Michael Jordan where he's got the six trophies. Hey, <laughs> you know what? Maybe, maybe I, I might post this today just to just take it in. I, I've never looked at it like that, you know, like at the, and and uh, it's funny because, you know, we talk about how so many times we want to make sure that we give other people their roses before they die. And mm -hmm. and the reality is, is that, yo, I think with the, the world that we live in and how crazy things are, yo, like sometimes it's OK for you to give yourself those same roses. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, to, it's man, funny, we... too, man. Yeah, you, you know, it, it's like when, when somebody say something negative to you. When you put something out there and somebody tell you that you're an idiot, it's like you can get a hundred thank yous, but that one person, man, that one person oh, yeah, that, that told you you're an idiot, it, it stands out. So you got to do that you for up, yourself. <laughs> yeah, that one to jack you up for real. And I think it's funny because that's that's me as a person. Like, so I, I care a lot about what people think, right? And so... Yeah. For me, it's crazy. I could get that. I could get that ninety nine, but that one is just kind of like. And I don't know if it's the thing of shooting for perfection, or I think just for so long, man. You talk about the mental health struggles, and part of that is people pleasing. And I'll get into that later on when it comes to my story and just how many times we can seek out validation in the wrong spaces. But man, like that is a real struggle and challenge for so many people. You, you know, you know I, I appreciate I, the. the I'll go, go ahead. Go I, was ahead gonna say, I found it interesting, you know, when you talk about um, people pleasing, but and I, I know we're going to get into that a bit later, but I, I find it interesting because cats like Michael Jordan, uh, they it's almost like they seek out that criticism. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I need that. I'll, I'll take those 99 thank yous, but I'm looking for that one one doubter, that that one hater. Um, and that's what that's what's going to build me. I love it. So after I finished watching the um, the documentary with um, with the, the Last Dance, so it's funny because I actually grew up in a really interesting confine to like being connected to the Jordan family, going to games, being able to sit in skybox with the fam. Like, um, so my my mom and dad, uh, Michael's first wife, uh, she's actually a, a very close friend of our family, and so. It's crazy as a kid that I didn't see that. But now as an adult, I'm looking at it and I'm like, man, like maybe I need to take that mentality. So I don't know if y'all seen the memes and the gifts that's been going around with Mike. It'll be like somebody basically say, hey, Mike, I hope you have a blessed and prosperous life. And then it's like Mike is like, I took that personal. Right. And then attacking the son. So I'm like, I think I need to start doing the same thing. When them negative comments come in, just hey, take it personal and produce greatness from it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he was so into that 
that he would make it up, you know? Like, you didn't have to say anything negative to him, and he would create his own story. <laughs> Which is so funny because I'm like, the crazy part is that we as humans, definitely when you talk about our mind and mental, mentally, we do that a lot already. Um, when it comes mm. to whether it's anxiety or um, just uh, what we would call self-sabotage, our thought processes, whatever it might be, a lot of times we we create a thought and then we allow our minds to run with that thought and none of it exists. And so I'm like, what happens if we could do that, but just frame it in the right in the right narrative and perspective to actually use it for something good? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, man, I, I got a question for you. I want to dive into your story in just a minute, but okay, just cool. kind of like at the level of mental health one-on-one, what is the difference between mental health and what people describe as as like having a positive mental attitude? So it's it's funny that you say that because I think when you talk about, okay, and, and I'll break it down like this because you shared this on the picture actually today when you promoted it on Twitter. And you put you posted the picture where I said we all have a mental health, and so I know yeah. this is actually to kind of come up again with one of the questions that came up from one of the followers on Twitter. Um, but I've actually utilized that for the last almost two years now as my basis to normalize the conversation to mental health as a whole. And the reason being is because I tell people that we all have a mental health, right? The mm. same way. And, and I remember when I first said this, I was at a conference with about 200 um, professionals from different levels of education and psychology. And when I said it, you would be surprised to see like mastered and PhD folks who griped at the fact that I said it in this presentation. And I, I had to break it down. I was like, before we, you know, get caught up, let me further explain. I said, we all have a mental health. It doesn't mean that we all have mental health issues. And I think as I did this, I didn't realize that I was saying it in a way that would kind of help form a narrative for people to take a different approach. But man, I've been running with it ever since. And so essentially, we all have a mental health, just like we all have a physical health that we have to take care of. Issues can come about and arise just like they do in our body when we don't make the proper investments to make sure that everything is good. So in an attempt to actually reform the narrative to break the stigma and to make an even playing field, we all have a mental health. Simple as that, right? Now, to yeah. your question, though, I think it's so dope. While we all possess a mental health, we don't, we don't all necessarily possess the, the, the positive mental, uh, what, what was the term you used? Yeah, the, the positive mental attitude, the optimistic, smiley kind of mindset, yeah. We don't all possess that. That comes, I think, through different uh, variables and levels, right? So for some of us, we might just be more optimistic people in our natural, you know, innate nature. But for others, like, it's funny because that's kind of like the relationship with my wife and I. Like, I'm an extroverted extrovert. I'm super optimistic. My wife is an introverted introvert. And she's not pessimistic, but she's very logical and and not rather moved by emotion, so to speak. And so it, it just goes into that whole conversation of how, like, we as people are all different. I think we all have the capacity to have a positive mental approach or a positive mental outlook. But once again, that comes into play with the investment that we're making into the initial mental health that we possess as a whole. Yeah, and that shifts the question from, am I being positive to am I doing what I need to do to be healthy in my own way? And that's yeah. that's a huge shift, man. Let, let, yeah. let's, go, let's go into how, how this become, became important to you. I, I wanna hear about about your story and, and, and what what gave you your wake up call? What tools did you use to kind of get on track? And, and what made you say, all right, I, I need to educate the world and, and normalize these discussions? Man, if so I could it, also it, add to that, oh, if I ahead, could add to TK's question as well, so I'm sorry to cut you off. Uh, but to TK's question, it was something that you, that you just mentioned that I find really interesting. I too am an extrovert and am super positive. So in your story, I'd kind of like to hear how that flip happened, how that how that switch, 
you know, where you were in a much tougher place and, and how you've kind of grown into this positive mindset. Because I think as somebody who is optimistic and who has um, just, a, you know, a brighter outlook on life, I've struggled to empathize with a lot of people who are struggling with mental health just because I can't put myself in those shoes. And I think, you know, you're unique because you've been on both sides of the table. Like, I think where I struggle with trying to relate relate to people and then, you know, on the other side, people struggle trying to relate to me and trying to explain to me, you've been on both sides. I'd love to hear more about that. Absolutely. Yeah. So just like from, from its original, you know, starting point, that origin piece was, I think I was like 10 or 11, man. And it started with bullying. Like I was, I had just transferred over to like my first public school. I was living in Chicago at the time. So I'm in Seattle now, been in Seattle for the last three years. Born and raised, bred in Chicago. The hood is still in me. And in that, um, I came from a private Christian school to a, a, a public school, and it was like night and day, right? And so I wasn't really aware of the change that was going to take place when it came to just how, you know, like, man, you know how it is. Private schools, man, definitely during a time where you were at a private school where paddling was still a thing. Like, you know, you... They'll pull out a paddle in a minute and you get whooped, you know? And so transitioning over to the public school side, it was it was different, man. And I'm from Chicago and I know y'all East Coast, right? And so when you talk about- I'm like from Chicago, public, bro. Oh yeah, so you, okay, you know, you, do you know? So like we come from a heavy roasting culture. Like we, you know, Chicago folks are different, man. And and it don't, yeah. it, it don't start when you become an adult. Like we roast at a young age and so, <laughs> Man, um, I went to uh, so y'all are from Chicago. So, man, being in uh, I was at uh, it it, it was Canner for a while, but it, it was originally Lewis Worth, right next door to Kenwood High School, um, yep, uh, in in the High Park neighborhood, and that was my first public school. And so transferring out of there, I mean transferring into there, man, I was bullied, you know, just going through that time and phase, and it was because of my weight. I was a short, fat, pudgy kid at the time. They used to call me uh. The Doughboy, Pillsbury Doughboy, poke you in the stomach, make the noise, did all of that. And, you know, it, 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 it was it was cool early on because I was trying to hold my own. But um, during this time and, and to the the second part of the question, I was always a bubbly person. I've always been an extrovert. However, I think when it comes to certain circumstances that happen, it can start to mold and change you in a different way and your approach to life then changes altogether, right? And so mm -hmm. I remained happy and giddy. I was just in a really rough storm early on to the point where the bullying led me to one day, you know, essentially getting tormented by the ringleader of all of the, the popular kids. And in that, um, I went home that day upset, realizing that I was being attacked because of the fact that I I, I was overweight and I, I wasn't cool and I wasn't fitting in and I wanted to just to the best of my ability seek out validation and so I said well maybe if I was smaller and maybe if I was more lean and, and I looked like them they would like me more and maybe if I didn't talk the way that I talked they would accept me. And so looking at it from like the weight standpoint, man, I, I was so disgusted with myself that I went home one day and before my mom and dad got home from work, before my brother got in from school, I went to the kitchen, took a butter knife and started trying to cut into my skin, thinking that it was going to cut fat off of my body. And so what I didn't realize was that during this time, the only thing that I had really done was open the doorway to what will become self-mutilation. And so over the next two years, it turned from self-mutilation to me utilizing it as a catalyst to, um, to help balance out the mental and the emotional pain that I was feeling. I, I thought that the physical aspect would help me to deal with the, the mental and emotional pain. And then interestingly enough, I got to high school. I went to Hills Franciscan my freshman year. After I transferred out of there, I went to King College Prep and I became a big time football player. And so the struggle took on a different mold then because by this time I'm taller, I've leaned out, I'm, you know, pretty boy quarterback and 
I found myself in this position to where the attention was back on me in a positive light. So I wasn't, I wasn't having to seek the validation as much. But what I noticed was that things started to turn around from a standpoint of there were several things taking place during that time. The first was that I was not privy to the fact that I was dealing with what we would now identify as, you know, being suicidal, dealing with depression, dealing with anxiety. And that comes from the stigmas that we have a lot of times in the black community when we talk about mental health, right? Black people don't deal with this. Your ancestors dealt with worse. I grew up in the church. So for me, it was a, a huge part of the conversation was around, um, you know, it's, it's a demon, just pray about it, right? Or I'm not praying hard enough. All of these different things and none of it, even though it was, and I, I say this a, a lot of times to audiences now, when it comes to parents, guardians, definitely from different communities of color, man, one of the things that I'm noticing more and more is that they literally tried to give encouragement with good intention off of what they knew, which wasn't much, specifically <clears throat> around the conversation of mental health, because it wasn't discussed. We learned to suppress. We learned to push it all down, and that was it. We weren't privy to how this thing worked, triggers, all of these other things. It was simply, hey, you better go depress them dishes or I give you everything that you need. You, you, you have no reason to be sad. This idea that the happiness comes through material and provision um, in that kind of way a lot of times, right? And so I don't, I don't hold anger or frustration with my parents. I understand that they just really didn't, they didn't get it at the time, right? And it's not just me and my situation. That's with many of us and in and, and the time that our folks grew up in, and then of course our grandparents, right? We weren't taught emotional intelligence, emotional stability, how to acknowledge, you know? And then of course, what happens in this house stays in this house. So the idea of going to therapy was not even a thing that we were gonna address. And so um, when I got to high school, it was interesting. While everything was good on the outside, and this is to our brother Kamal's point or question, I should say, but um, w what ended up taking place was that I got back into my happy-go-lucky mode, but I started developing under the umbrella of what we would identify as high-functioning depression. So mm. I was giddy on the outside. I was, I was everybody's cheerleader. I'm rah, rah, rah. But at the end of the day, I felt empty once everybody else was gone. I, I dealt with this question a lot of, you know, am I worth it? And it only, it came in, 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 in came in spurts. It, it was at its ugliest and at its worst when I might've had a game where I didn't have a good game. I threw three interceptions. I'm thinking about my coach's words to me or because of validation, it starts early. The relationships that didn't go right and feeling like, oh, well, I'm worthless, right? And then allowing that to seep in and it's now a thing of me questioning my worth physically here on earth and in life. And so this is where the suicide attempt started to take a greater uh, toll on me to where it wasn't a thing of, of, of just, oh, I'm sad. It's like, no, nah, you know what? The pressures are too much for me and I don't want to be here. And yeah. so yeah. it was this big fireball. Uh, I, I come out of high school after finding out that I have an enlarged heart. And during 06, 07, this was still during a period of time where colleges weren't really sure how to get a handle on working with athletes that might have like abnormal heart issues or whatever, but, but still fine tuned athletes that can play. You just got to figure out how to work with it. And um, I lost my scholarship offers. I ended up going to Northern Illinois University and um, in my time there, uh, I, I just I went through a crazy 18 month slump of just depression and everything that was suppressed from the first eight years so far, finally starting to come to a head. Right. And so it got to a point within the 18 months, essentially, I, mean, I was failing in school with a 1.4 GPA. I'm on academic probation. They're getting ready to kick me out. We're talking three full semesters in now. Um, I gained 170 pounds during that time and my health got really bad. I was in an abusive relationship. I know men don't always talk about it, but 
I, I, because of the seeking validation and just being okay with the bare minimum for the sake of saying that I had something for the sake of even though it hurts me, it still gives me comfort. All of these things combined and I embraced it and I allowed it in my life. It led me to Dr. King Day of 2008, which I believe we celebrated on January 21st that year. And um, this was the day before classes were about to resume at school for me. And man, just, it was literally one of those straws that broke the camel's back situations. And in that, um, I found myself, uh, uh, man, just uh, at, a, at a place with my ex at the time, girlfriend, going back and forth, shout match, me just finally being over it, having a knife and a pair of scissors in my hand and taking a blade down my wrist five times, basically saying, if you don't give a care about me, then I don't give a care about me. And just went, man, blacked out. And, and, and it's crazy because I've actually been reflecting on that part of the story. And I don't want to veer off too much with this, but I reflected on that part of the story as it happened and the blood is dripping from my arm and I'm bleeding profusely. And I got a friend trying to help me on one side and then I got the RA on the other side and now they've got to get the police involved and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about the situations that we're seeing and it's crazy bro six books six 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 great books like you mentioned right traveling the world speaking podcast heard all throughout the globe people saying oh this story is so inspiring but I can't help but to think like even in a moment's time like this with the tense reality that we deal with while this story is so all inspiring for people now man at, at the same time I'm like yo in that moment in my pain in in all of this that was taking place I could have been shot dead as soon as the officers got there and so it, it just blows my mind because I'm like yo like and we could call it survivor's guilt, but I'm like, yo, like, why me? Why do I deserve when we look at the situations taking place right now? And like I said, I'm not going to veer off with that, but I just want to, I want to put that out there for somebody who needs to hear that because a lot of the times what I'm seeing now is that some of the same stories that we'll praise later on, we'll condemn right now because they haven't meet, made it to where they're going to be when, when they're going to be there and they lose the opportunity to be anything better. I'm not going to get into that right now, though, but I just preach I, I that, feel brother. that preach it, brother. <laughs> I, I, I feel that, though, because we, we get this a lot. And so for me personally, I just want to encourage with that, man. But that was me. I blacked out. The police are now escorting me out of the building, taking me into the ambulance. And I get to the hospital and the doctor is like, Mr. Taylor, you you slit like the top of my wrist up here. The, the vein up here, he was like, you you literally tapped it, but no blood would come out. He was like, it's obvious you got a purpose in life, but you need to figure out what it is. And that has been the struggle for me during that time was I always felt like I lacked purpose. And so it just so happened that a brother by the name of Quincy Payton, who became my first mentor, he saw my story in the school newspaper in the police beat, reached out to me and, and was like, Richard, you made a mistake, but this does not have to be the end of your life. And that hit me hard because this was the first time that in the fullness of my mess, somebody saw me and didn't judge me and didn't and didn't run away, but embraced me and gave me a chance. And this was important because to Kamal's question, I, I dealt with the high functioning depression. And because I was going through so many internal issues, even when I got to college, I wasn't playing football anymore. But I'm doing all of this and dealing with all of this. And I'm now the president of a, of a Christian fraternity. I'm one of the leaders of my school's gospel choir. I'm a part of, uh, of, of I, I worked in the residence hall. I, I'm working in different realms with like student government and helping out on campus and volunteering. And I'm trying to put out the image that I want people to see so they don't see my hurt and my pain. And I think that that's so important because during this process of being able to sit on both sides of this as a person who's always been an optimistic extrovert but lacked the vision to see themselves better i i realized that for me a big part of my change and what i'm doing now to help other people is the fact that whether it is from the typical standpoint of seeing somebody who's sad and down or 
an individual who's there and, and for everybody, we've got to do a better job of paying attention to people. And this is what has really pushed me from a heart standpoint of this work. I had somebody who saw me. He knew the work that I had done on campus, but he also knew like, yo, you got a ton of baggage that needs to be unpacked. And so in order for me to stay in school, I had to meet with the Dean of Students. And this part of the story is important because prior to this, the conversation of therapy and counseling was never a thing. But the mm -hmm. Dean of Students put me on a two year probationary period. And a part of that probation was having to go and see uh, one of the, the uh, counselors or therapists at my college in the counseling department. And I fought it internally. I wrestled. I didn't really fight it with him because I'm like, I, I want to stay in school. But I wrestled from the standpoint of like, man, like, I ain't crazy. I don't need no shrink. Like, you know, I'm going through all of those, you know, conversations that we hear definitely in the black community about, you know, our, our plight when it comes to just embracing the idea of going to therapy. And and but I, I'm glad I'm glad that I did because what it helped me to realize was that, Richard, you're not crazy. And this person isn't trying to be in your business. But what this person is able to do right now is to help you unpack a lot of your traumas, a lot of the issues, a lot of the things that you're going through, um, being able to put a name behind, you know, your triggers, what it is that that causes you to flip and snap like this, the anger that you deal with. And so in it, it reframed my understanding and my perspective of it. And so, uh, yeah, did that during that two year probationary period and um Man, uh, I think once I graduated from college, I worked one job down at Roosevelt University for like half a year. And then after that, I was just like, man, like I, I, I want to do something more. And and I think just in that process, man, I, I lost 170 pounds after gaining it. Um, I, I went through my own healing, but I, I didn't realize that my story and just me being myself as a lover of people was helping other people. And so I put some intentionality behind it and mobilized it to the work that I'm doing now. And I'm a hush there because I know I talked a lot. <laughs> Man, no, this is a powerful story. Oh, please don't apologize for that. So so th there was one thing you talked about. Y you said it as an aside. You talked about how you were in a, an abusive relationship. And you said, I know there's mm -hmm. something that a lot of men don't talk about. I like to take yeah. a minute and kind of segue into talking about men and mental health. What Absolutely. One of the... Yeah, one one of the things I love about your Instagram is you, you've got this great balance between sort of like the aesthetic good imagery, but you always put lessons in everything you do, and you do a lot of different series. and And I think it's this month you're actually focusing on on mental health for men. And this is something yeah. that you said in one of your posts that 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 really struck me. You said, um, "Let's talk about the man up concept." While mm -hmm. I get its premise. I'm realizing at its core, this notion can do more harm than good. We can't keep suppressing our emotions because with enough time, what we think is suppressed is actually waiting for its boiling point. You deserve better. So I encourage you to take the time to face those emotions head on, learn them, understand them, and embrace them. Brothers, listen, stress from suppression, being Superman and manning up with no true healing can lead to an early grave. All right, here's the thing. A lot of brothers out there feel like if I cry, right, or 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 if I express my emotions vulnerably, that that might make me weak. That might make me someone that becomes easy to walk over. And there there are certain situations where, as men, we feel pressured to kind of have a tough exterior in order to acquire people's respect. How does someone apply what it is you're talking about? without being dishonest with themselves about those concerns? So I think what, what we've got to do and what's helped me um, has been understanding that the reality is, is that when you embrace those emotions, when you learn to cry, and, and that's the thing, I think I would say, before we get to the cry piece, we've got as men to do a better job of being able to even acknowledge our emotions, right? So last mm -hmm. week, 
I um, let you know. So yes, June, the month of June is Men's Health Month, right? And so for the month of June, what I've been doing is a series where I use, I do a Mental Health Monday every Monday, but I've dedicated the, the series this month to men. And so last week's post, I talked about how um, your feelings don't make you weak, right? So in order for us to get to the part of maybe an emotional response that is crying, we have got to get to the part of embracing the emotions first, right? And so I broke this mm. down in three different ways that I thought was was helpful. The first was that um, embracing your feelings, what it, what it does is that it's showing you strength in three capacities. The first is the strength of awareness. Um, the second would be the strength of understanding after you become aware. And then finally, you have the strength of the willingness to transform and change for the better. And so in order to get to the point where you cry um, and, and stand true to what you feel, I think a lot of it really just comes to the understanding of your feelings, right? And finding the strength behind it. You, you, you set yourself up to become a more effective man and essentially a human being to everybody that you come in contact with when you can learn to acknowledge your emotions, become aware of them, learn how they function. And then from that, getting a chance to not just allow your emotions to get the best of you by thinking that ignoring them is actually helping you when all it's doing is causing the emotions to be pushed down. And then at some point in time, when you're triggered hard enough from, uh, a relationship gone bad, a friendship gone bad, a money deal gone bad. Man, let's take it to Boondocks, man. I, I, I'm a huge fan of the Boondocks, man. That, that yo, that that moment, right? That, that Stink Meter episode that talked about the moments that we have. It could be as simple as you brushing up past another brother and y'all bumping to each other. Next thing you know, that moment is getting ready to happen, right? Like, it doesn't always have to be this huge thing that is the straw that breaks the camel's back or, or that leads to the, the highest point of contention. Like sometimes it's just a small icing on the cake, but everything else has already been built there. And so I think it's mm. important for us to make sure that we are mindful of the emotions because when we do this, what we're essentially doing is combating the man up stigma that has been put out here. And it's not to say that this idea of of manning up is completely bad, right? Like I get the idea from a standpoint of I'm, I, I'm, I'm manning up in a moment to where I'm finding my strength to be able to face what I'm facing right now in the heat of the moment. But that is not how it's approached. Man up has hmm. literally become a thing of, all right, be a man, you can't cry, you can't show emotion, you can't show fear. And as soon as we've gotten to a place where we've got it down, we never go back and address what made us feel the way that we felt in that moment. We're not going back and addressing why we felt that way in that moment. And so that that constant suppression over time will lead to breakdowns. And I talked about an early grave. That early grave can come in a few different facets. It can come through us getting to a point where as men, we do something that causes us to maybe be suicidal because we haven't dealt with our feelings. Maybe we have a homicidal act. You know, I, man, when I was in Chicago, I did a lot of mentoring work back in my old high school at King. And I worked with a lot of young brothers in the city through the work that I did through Ada S. McKinley. And so in this time frame of doing this, man, getting a chance to see some of these homicides straight on and how it was something small that got to that point. But then understanding the brothers that I was working with who were sometimes the victims or maybe the perpetrator in those moments, yo, like... This was actually a heavy mental health implication that we should have paid attention to ahead of time and didn't realize and recognize. That's one way. The suicidality, right? The suicide is another. And then finally, man, the early grave for some of us that suppress our emotion just comes from stress. Stress is such a big killer for us, right? Like we're holding all of this in. We're not talking. We're not dealing. We, 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 we embrace community, but the community that we're embracing is 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 a, a halfway community so it works for us from the standpoint of like we embrace this community when we go and hang whether we hitting up navy piers rooftop bar or whether we go into a bulls game or a bears game um or or whether we are you know kind of just hanging out 
with the guys, but there's no intentionality behind the other half that says, hey, bro, how are you doing as a person? What's going on with you internally? You know, like having those deeper, more intentional conversations with people that we call friends, right? And so I think that it is important for us to understand that. And I love it, man. Brother Jason Wilson does a phenomenal job with the teachings on this, but man, like being able to cry like a man. And what does that mean? It simply means to be able to cry. Men cry, men have emotions, men have feelings. There are things that tug at our heart. And it doesn't always have to be at the funeral of a brother that we cared about or, or somebody that we that we loved, right? It doesn't always have to be, you know, um, over, over things that we, it's kind of like we've set this pedestal and precedence for what deserves our tears. And the unfortunate mm. part is that a lot of the times the things that we've placed on the pedestal, they're important, but they're, they're what we might consider necessity cries. But I would actually challenge to say, hey, there's an area where everything doesn't have to be a necessity in order for you to cry. What about the areas of just, man, I just really feel like I want to cry right now. I don't know why. I can't put words behind it. I haven't put a name on it. But the wanting, the desire to just release it, because that's what it is. It is a release. And so for me, I have no problem telling people that I cry all the time. Sorry, guys. I have no problem. Like, man, I cry when I need to, whether it comes through the form of worship or I could be driving in my car and just, man, even with everything that's been going on from, from what we're seeing with the uprising right now, man, just in the moments where it just feels heavy and I just got to let this go because if I don't, it's going to consume me. And it might, it might come out in the form of anger. It might come out in the form of rage. It might come out in a very non-productive form. And, and so I just... Uh, for me, I think that the man up concept, it did what it did and it actually set us back more than it helped us. And now we have got to reframe the narrative with it. That's powerful. You know, what you're saying about crying or just expressing any emotion is true about so many other things. When you, when you do it regularly, you don't have to do it dramatically, right? Yeah, it, it, it's sort yeah. of like, it's sort of like expressing to someone that you're not happy with something. If, if you just say it over that small thing, nobody mm -hmm. remembers two weeks from now that there was even a yeah. conversation about it. It's really nothing yeah. at all. But if you let five or six moments go by where you don't say anything about something small that really bothered you, then you have the boondocks moment where you're overreacting to somebody stepping on your toe. You're ready to throw yeah. blows over something really little, man, you know? That's, that's, that's powerful. Well, let's talk about the times we're in now. I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but we had uh, Urban Monk last week talk with us about racism. He shared a lot of stories about his family experience and some of the things that he deals with as a pastor with addressing his community. A lot of conversations right now are being had about racial tension. And these conversations, yeah. some of it due to misunderstanding and the ways we're talking past each other, it's making us angry. It's making us hurt. But even apart mm -hmm. from that, just watching video footage of, of real tragedies happening, watching video footage of people getting hurt or killed, regardless of what your interpretation of what's happening is, we're exposing Absolutely. ourselves to so much violence. And, and I've heard people say things like, I just need a break. I just yeah. need a break. And, 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 and you also hear some saying, we don't have the luxury of taking a break. This is reality. So how do you honestly, how do you find that balance between honestly addressing issues that aren't just gonna magically disappear while at the same time taking care of yourself so that you can last for the long haul? So I would challenge the notion slightly that says we don't have time to take a break. Um, and the reason why I would say that is because while we don't have the time we've got to make it. And so even, and, and, and so this is how I find balance. And I've been struggling, I've actually been wrestling with this over the last two weeks, but learning to find moments just to simply come up for air before getting back into the fight. And I think too, what we've got to realize is that just because we fell off or fell back doesn't mean that we're falling off. 
And so I think that that's going to be so important when we talk about this, because I know a part of the tension and wrestle within ourselves is that if I if I pull back for just a quick second right now, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to lose my stride. You're not. And, and here's the reality, too. I'd rather you take a small break right now because you're needed in the work rather than having to take a permanent break because you're not even physically here to be able to continue the work. And so this is what I say when it comes to because what we're seeing with the racial trauma and let's just take it from this side here as as black men who've had to deal with it. Right. Um, and, 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 and people who are seeing it as well, you're you're experiencing what we in the mental health field would normally kind of predicate to just. Um, therapists and counselors and psychologists, which is vicarious trauma or secondary trauma. But the reality is, is that with the accessibility that social media has allowed, everybody is able to experience that now because the norm is you can watch a video for eight minutes and 46 seconds of, of a man being killed on the street. You can watch the Ahmaud Arbery um, you know, tape and, and get a chance to, to live that and then to hear what was said and and done. You, you, you we've seen it countless times. Right. Like and I'm I'm not coming at nobody, but man, like it doesn't help when we got social platforms that glorify it. Right. And so in that we have got a responsibility within ourselves that says, OK, how much of this vicarious trauma am I willing to take in? And then with the vicarious trauma that I'm willing to take in, because I know that I'm taking it in, what am I going to do as far as not allowing it to become a part of me and being intentional about releasing it so that it doesn't eat away at me, so that I am taking time for some simple self-care in order for me to get back out on the front lines in whatever capacity that is to get the work done. I feel like a lot of times yeah. it's very easy to emotionally get caught up from the stuff that we're seeing, right? And sometimes what we're seeing, it doesn't always go back to the work that we're doing within this space. And so I would just want to give a few things when it comes to being able to deal with the vicarious trauma for those that say, hey, I don't necessarily have all the time in the world. I got to be right back out here. Um, yo, so a, a few things that we can do to work this to just help with Finding a balance, obviously self-care is at the top for me. And that is simply to say that for many of us, we get so exhausted that once we're done, cause we do, we all get breaks. Like we got 24 hours in a day. We all get some small time. The question is what is our intent and what are we doing with that time once it's, once we get it? Are we, are we actually taking that time to be intentional on our investment? Um, when it comes to what we're listening to that is different from the work that we're doing? Is it is it, you know, us being able to take some time just to get out and walk, to breathe, to get a little bit of physical activity in on from an exercise standpoint? So self-care is always at the top for me. I think it's just a matter of how we prioritize self-care in these tough times, right? But beyond that, we've got to learn to monitor our intake. And I'm, I'm going off of what I did last month for the vicarious trauma piece. So I'm going to read these to you. You got to pay attention to your levels of compassion, fatigue, exhaustion, and burnout. Those are all serious. You will never be as effective as you, you can be for the people that you are serving if you yourself aren't being filled up. Mm -hmm. You got to talk about what you feel. So this is where my wrestle comes in as a leader who is helping people through this on social platforms and in real life. But I am having to go and seek out my mentors to talk about what's going on, what I'm feeling, my wise counsel from the faith side, my friends who are there, you know, identifying people that will listen to you and give you space to vent safely is so important. You got to be mindful of your boundaries. Consider limiting the number of videos, pictures, and comments you're taking in. And I really want to dive into that comment piece real quick because of the fact that with COVID happening, with us being quarantined, a lot of what we're getting right now is through social media, right? Some states are finally getting to a, a phase of one or two 
where certain things are slightly reopening. But the reality is that the time that we've gotten with quarantine has allowed us more of an opportunity to be on our phones and in the social. And one of the areas that I've seen a lot of anger and frustration come in is in that comment section with people who mm -hmm. don't get it, with people who refuse to get it, with people who will try and negate your lived experience with their opinions. Yo, at the end of the day, one of the things that I have vowed to do for myself is not give energy and time to somebody who has not walked a mile or at least a foot in these shoes. Mm -hmm. And that comes a lot of times through the comment section. So we have got to be very careful in trying to argue somebody into oblivion, right? I mentioned the seeking out of wise counsel. And then finally, listen, in self-care, embrace small opportunities to be renewed. Simple as that. This can happen through faith practices like prayer, self-care activities, reading, writing, podcasting, gaming. Like I'm even encouraging, like, look, bro, if you need to get up and whoop <laughs> on somebody on 2K for a minute, do your thing. Like, but but in this though, because what happens is, is that if we if we flow with the mentality of we don't have time to to take care of ourselves from the work, what we're going to then do is allow ourselves to be consumed by the work. And mm. if, okay, homicidal and suicidal thoughts don't take you out, the stress will. Because it's not just going to be a thing on your mind, it's going to be a thing on your body. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be carrying a ton of weight and that you're going to be fatigued physically like that. But what it does say is, is that you've put your body into an overdrive and a work that it is not used to and that it cannot continue to manage the functionality of. And so in that, we will start to see ailments come physically um, because of it. So while we say, oh, I don't have the time, I'm just going to push back a little bit and say, hey, make the time. Because if you don't make the time right now, you are going to find yourself in a position to even if it's a year or two from now where you will no longer have the time at all. And, and truthfully, yeah. everybody who is in this fight, you are needed. You are valued. But the reality is, is that you become a burden to the people that you are trying to serve when you're supposed to be a blessing from a, a fruitful place. But instead, you're bleeding out because you're drained. You're completely dehydrated and you don't have much of yourself to give. Mm. Yeah, man. Richard, there's that, something really I actually wanted to dive into. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard the statistic, but during the time of COVID, there's been the same amount of deaths through suicide that we would expect during a normal year. Um, yes. and, and that's something that's huge to me, right? During, during this time where a lot of people are, um, I think, indirectly being affected by it through their own mental health, right? Through Again, yeah. some of the things you talked about watching it on social media. Um, but then the other side of that is is for people who actually have battles with mental health that were that were happening prior to COVID. And, you know, the state of the world just exasperated that. And then yeah. so I, I kind of got uh, two things that I'd, I'd love to hear you weigh in on because um, I've directly had experience where um, somebody who's close to me in my immediate family, a sibling of mine, um, was suicidal and 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 made an attempt um, just a couple weeks ago, and so I think you know for myself it I I think I took it for granted. I took mental health for granted. I, I didn't see the signs, uh, and and I thought it was something that could be negotiated with. I think a lot of people in um, our community, but especially men, you know, were thinkers. Were 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 people who logically work our way through things that okay if um you know if there is a hole in the road or if if the if the bridge fell out okay i need to build a bridge to get across it we don't necessarily think um or feel into how that made us feel how is this how are the feelings of this bridge collapse collapsing affecting us and i think you know from my personal experience you know, going back to what you said about therapy and men, um, monitoring that mental health, it was something that was never an option really as a kid. I think part of it is the financial aspect. And then part of it is just like, it's kind of weird. Like, why are you going to therapy? Are you, are you crazy? Like, is there something wrong with you? And I think 
that's something now that I'm, I'm kind of opening myself up to. And, and it's something that I'm exploring with my family and, and just the benefits of that. But I, I wanted to hear for, you know, just you kind of hear you weigh in about the people who had prior struggles and battles with mental health. What does that look like during this time where it's exasperated? And then the people speaking to people like me who are supporting those people who are struggling with mental health during this time, because I think what what's clear to me is that in the support of somebody who already has mental health challenges, I'm at risk myself of um, going down a, a dark path of mental health because of the stress that comes with it, because of the sacrifice, because of the emotional toll in seeing somebody else that you love going through it. And so, you know, there there's certain precautions and preventative measures that I'm trying to take for myself to make sure that I'm whole to be whole for somebody else. And so I would love to That's hear you just weigh on 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 the people who are directly affected um, and then the people who are supporting the people who are directly affected. That's a great question. So I think for the people that are directly affected, um, we, we've got to be able to do several things like and, and just as an encouragement to each and every person who is like your your family member in that struggle is your life is valuable um and an early grave is not your calling that is what i've been telling people for a while now um and i think that's important because many times what and i've learned this from my own experience man like i got so consumed with wanting to die and trying to um, attempt suicides that as i finally got to the healing portion i realized that i never fully knew what it was like to live like I was going through life just striving, but not actually thriving. I was surviving, but not actually in a space where I was thriving. And so I looked at life from this one eye view of how I was seeing it from my space and not understanding that um, it was greater than that, but there was a few things that would be needed. The first would be a perspective shift. And then I think after that would be an embrace that uh, of, of, I always say behavior changes with belief, but um, belief usually comes through exposure of something better. And so um, I think that those are so important when we talk about components. I want to I want to take you back to day two of the 31 days of power mental health series that I did last month, because I feel like it is very strong when it comes to things that people who are struggling for the first time because of what COVID has presented, people who've struggled for a while and then individuals in between who are connected to those struggling. And it, it was called um, proactive approaches for our mental health. Remember what I said about how we all have a mental health, right? And so one of the ways that we can help it is by learning to be proactive rather than reactive because a lot of times we, we usually do find ourselves on the reactionary side of um, uh, of a suicide attempt or a person opening up about depression. And a lot of times we miss signs that are right there in our face, right? And so I wanna encourage proactive approaches for individuals who aren't necessarily going through it or are going through it for the first time, but then also those who struggle. And that is, the first thing I wanna encourage is thinking before we act, right? I think it's so important to embrace logical thinking. Um, because the reality is, is that when you talk about mental health and when you talk about like anxious thoughts that tend to come definitely from, you know, times like where we are now, whether it comes through racial tension or the fact that COVID, you know, was COVID, COVID is in itself a form of trauma. It's trauma, right? From the definition that it it has literally stripped power and control away from us. And there's nothing that we can do about it as far as changing it, stopping it ceasing it and so when anxiety kicks in in moments like that where trauma comes in logical thinking for us tends to go out the door and we panic right and so just to pull it back in i want to i want to encourage the embrace of logical thinking before you act on what you feel and this is why feelings are fickle which means that feelings aren't always true right mm -hmm. one of the things that i'm real big on is simplifying the conversation of mental health and so when you start breaking down on a greater context what it is you're struggling with right you will notice that a lot of times our struggles tend to flow from anxious thoughts anxious feelings 
um, uh, uh, words that were said and done, negative experiences and trauma. So let's break those down a little more, right? And in that, I think one of the things we recognize is that what we feel, um, a lot of times feelings are lying to us, right? When we feel like we are unworthy or don't belong or don't deserve to live, these are feelings that are lying to us, right? And we've just gotta be very careful to not make deposits into things that may not ever happen because that's what anxiety is a lot of times for us and so um, i also want to encourage embracing like community there is such i talk about it in my fifth book the other side um there is power in community right and and right now with where we are with COVID and everything else um it's so important for us to make sure that we don't give up on community whether you are extroverted or introverted as a human being we are relational in our nature, right? The beauty of community is that it doesn't have to be a sit down powwow where everybody's about to have a session for you in one big group setting. Community is literally uh, a family member here that I'm close to, a friend here, maybe it's wise counsel spiritually here, a therapist there, but whoever you have in that space that has your best interest at heart, it is so important for us to be leaning in into those relationships right now. Um, there are definitely some benefits to attempting at least uh, one meaningful connection a day, right? And that's the beauty. Like, I'm not saying you got to have a ton of people mm. at one time. Just one meaningful connection can make such a huge difference, right? Um, and then we've got to take care of our body. We've got to get moving, right? These are just all proactive approaches that we can take right now. The beauty of moving is that physical activity can help to clear our minds when our thoughts try and run wild. But also, um, it, it, what it does is that physical activity and moving, whether this comes through exercising or doing some jumping jacks, getting your stretching in, whatever it might be, what it does is that it can actually hijack those anxious thoughts and put you back into a space that helps you just to get grounded, if nothing else, for the moment, right? And then in that, I think that these are some things that can can definitely help on all sides when we talk about us being proactive. Um, I think that there is a responsibility as well for us to make sure that we are also releasing what we're feeling from the pain standpoint, right? And this is for everybody, not just men, but everybody in general, right? We have got to release that pain. And so we can do this through acknowledging our pain, identifying our pain after we've acknowledged it. I talked about the movement, so getting in motion, um, but then also putting a name behind what it is that you're feeling in order to express what you're feeling, right? And so putting a name behind it, identifying it, talking it out with friends, but then also too, in a moment in time like this, with COVID, with racial tensions, we have got to be able to um, to truly, uh, I, I think more than anything else, we've got to recognize the triggers that rest around us as well, right? Because that is a big part of what we are going through in this season and in, in this moment is that there are some legitimate triggers that are running rampant that are heightening this for us and we don't always realize it. Um, for those of us who might be in a deeper battle when it comes to, you know, a deeper slump of depression or maybe the suicidal thoughts and actions, if I can, guys, I just want to, I'm going to flow with what I had on the 31 days real quick. Um, when it comes to that, uh, I just, some things that I think are so important and, and, and for family members and friends who are connected to family and friends who might be suicidal, two things you can do right now to be a greater help. The first is simply to be present. It's so important for us to just like, yo, like there is so much power in you simply being there for somebody. Um, and then and then also with you being present, stay calm when you speak to them in, in a reassuring tone, right? One of the things that I noticed in certain conversations when I was suicidal and I was on the brink or the verge was that, the conversation coming back to me was abrasive and it didn't help at all in the calls of me feeling like I wanted to stay. 
So during those conversations, yo, stay calm and speak with a reassuring tone. Acknowledge that their feelings and what they're going through are legitimate. Now hear me, there's a difference between them being true and being legitimate. Just because I'm telling you that what you feel as a person is legit doesn't mean that I am speaking truth to it. So you tell me, Richard, I feel sad. Guess what? That feeling is legit, but let's go ahead and break down what is causing this sadness and try and find the, the disconnect within that. Um, offer support and encouragement. Be president, uh, present, excuse me. Let's make sure that we're reducing access to lethal means. And then also in our us being present, I just want to encourage those who are helping individuals to not feel like you need to have all of the answers. Now, this is important for two reasons. The first is that sometimes people just need you there to listen. And not, usually they need you there to listen. They want We want to know that somebody cares. I know I did. So knowing that somebody cares is so helpful. But the second part to this that I think is going to be so important as well is going to be the fact that we don't need to have all the answers because when we don't, and we feel like we do, we start to gain a struggle mentally and emotionally to where we feel powerless. So this not feeling the notion or the need to have all of this right away is important for the one that we're helping, but also for ourselves. And I just wanna encourage that because I think that when we can do that, what it does is it helps us to realize that we are flowing in power by simply being rather than feeling like we've got to put on and do more than what we're called to do in that moment. Man, this is, I, I, I feel like we got a, we got a full workshop here, man. I, I feel like uh, <laughs> one, one of the hard things about being able to get you on is you're doing so many workshops. You're helping so many people. You're busy for all the right reasons, living out your calling. And, and I feel like it was, it was a blessing to, to be able to have you here and and drop so much so much insight, I'm gonna have to go back, listen to the recording, and take notes. But I, I want you to tell the people where they need to go to be able to buy your books, um, to be able to follow you on Instagram and so forth, so they can find more of you. Dope, dope, dope. Yeah. So um, all of my books are available on my website, richardtaylorjr.com. That's richardtaylorjr.com. Instagram is richard.taylorjr. Facebook, Richard L. Taylor Jr. Um, in, uh, uh, LinkedIn is Richard L. Taylor Jr. And then Twitter is at Truly Taylor May. You can also catch my podcast. It airs every Monday and Thursday. It's called Between the Dream. All you have to do is search Between the Dream on all podcast streaming platforms. Um, and, and yeah, that's me. That's my work. And that's where I am. Oh, and be on the lookout too. Could... Um, I'm about to make an announcement here with you guys that I haven't made anywhere else. But um, next month... Um, I will actually be taking the 31 Days of Power series that I've done and making it into a full-on book that is going to be a 31-day mental health journal. And so with that, man, we are number seven, baby. <laughs> Come on. Hey, what, we, we getting into is that Bill Russell territory now, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yo, yo, but no, and, and no, in that, I'm like, we've got to continue to um, bridge that gap to simplify these conversations. I think it's so important. Yeah. Well, you're about to be the GOAT, man, if, you, if you're not already in the conversation already. <laughs> I appreciate um, that. <laughs> <laughs> for, for everybody that's tuning in, don't forget, um, we'll, we'll be live streaming tomorrow at noon. Um, that'll be an, another um, edition of TK's Two Cents. But every Tuesday, every Wednesday, every Thursday, check us out at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Richard, man, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. This was a uh, Really valuable brother stuff, my brother. Thank you all so much for having me, man. We'll definitely have to uh, hit up either Giordano's or Luminati's when I get back home. So, Oh, man, it's on. It. It's on. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> all right, brother. Peace. All right, now. Thank you, guys.